It will start here in, in Genesis 1 in the passage that we um, spoke from last week with Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Uh, let's read those verses real quick and then we'll jump back in for, for part two of that. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So the Lord created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over all the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And we dug into this uh, fairly significantly. I'm not going to do a lot of, uh, of review for time's sake. It's available on Facebook and YouTube. So if, if you wonder where we're starting off from, uh, you can go back and catch up if you weren't here last Sunday. Um, but I will say this, that, that what we covered was for sure um, a very critical principle out of God's word. It is the, the, the end for which man was created. This, this being an image bearer of God and the dominion mandate. That's what we really laid out last week. But in the middle of all of that, we kind of hit both sides of it. We, we hit the be fruitful and multiply and the expansion of that dominion that he gives to every human being that he gives stewardship to over that portion of creation that he is responsible for. Then we look here and in the middle of all of that, there's that verse there in 27 that says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and he did create them. Uh, we'll see in, in chapter two how that creation, how the history of it, what the circumstances were of it happening. Um, Adam was crafted from clay by the very hand of God. God breathes, ruach, breathes life into him and, and he becomes a living being. He becomes a living soul. He, he is a rational person created for interaction with God himself. And I'm just going to read through, uh, for, for time's sake, I'm going to hit just the passages that cover the theme that we're going to be speaking into this morning, which is this male and female, he created them, and the significance of that within the purposes which God created mankind to fulfill. And, and we see it under great assault today, but male and female was the intention of God from the beginning, and it was up to him to define that. So we want to jump over to chapter two of Genesis. I'm going to read a few verses. I'm going to read seven through nine, and then we're going to read from 16 down through 25. Uh, and I'm just going to go progressively through this. I, you know, many times I'll read it all and then take it apart piece by piece. We're just going to pause at each place that I have something that I want to inject layer upon layer. And I want to fill this out because uh, my message this morning is not going to be so much about all the perversions of this that are afoot today and how that we should stand against all the abominations that are, are, are blanketing our culture today. They are myriad, but all of them have one thing in common. 
They are deviations from God's intent. They are deviations from God's stated will and purpose. And when we deviate from God's will and purpose, then we have strayed. We have gone, it doesn't matter how culturally accepted. I mean, these things which are acceptable today may be fully embraced even more than they are today someday into the future. That is not in any way, shape, or form the, the justification as to whether we embrace them or not. We have a God set on this, and what God said goes. So all of those, you know, I could go down through the list, and this is why this is wrong, and this is why this is wrong. It, it's, I've used this example for several different things over the years. It's like within a, a bank situation. If you want to teach people how to find counterfeits, you get them very familiar with the characteristics of the real. As long as you can tell what's real, all the counterfeits are going to stick out much more readily than if you went out to, to study all of the counterfeits so that you could know that something was real. Counterfeiters will, will do all that they can to make their work acceptable, but only that which is real can you bank on. And that's what we have here as God's word. And he created them male and female. He created them male and female within this dominion mandate that we talked about so much last week that I didn't get to this portion in last week's message. So we're going to take a little deeper dive. I feel like it was just perfect in the providence of God that this would spill over into its own message because we can go a little further into this than what we would have had I just did what I intended to last week. So let's jump, jump in. It's in chapter 2, verse 7. And we'll just read 7 through 9 real quick. It says, And the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord, out of the ground, the Lord God made every creature to grow that is pleasant for the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we'll just pause there. I actually read a little farther than I intended to. <coughs> Excuse me. But when we look here and we see that, that that's just such common uh, understanding for those of us at least that were raised within the church. There was never a time that I could recall when I did not believe that man was a special creation of God and that God took the man and removed a rib from him, as we'll see a little later on, and, and created woman as a helpmate for him. I mean, that, that was just baseline knowledge that I was raised with. It was within the home that I was raised. It was within the church that I was raised. And there wasn't any pushback on that. I never even thought to question that. <laughs> and I never, honestly, even when I was at... To, to the depths of my sinfulness in, in my late teens and early 20s, this never came into question. It, it was just, it was so, uh, it was a presupposition. It was foundational in the understanding that it was something that I had never questioned. But we see people questioning around about us all the time. God it did do his special creation with Adam. He created, he formed him, and he breathed life into him. And when he did so, he did so and made him an image bearer of God. And it is absolutely the reason that God 
created Adam first. He created Adam. He didn't create the first couple. He created Adam and then brought Eve out of Adam. He started with a unity. He started with one man. And then the one became two. And then through coupling them back together again, through marriage, he brings them back together and then he makes the two one. But he started with a unity. This is part of that which it means to be born or be created in the image of God. Within us, there is a unity. That there is a unity within an individual. We already talked about that last week. Body, soul, and spirit. Three components of one individual. But then within marriage, God brings two separate human beings. He sovereignly welds them together spiritually. They come together physically. There's a spiritual component to this oneness that is created. It is created so that we can be the image bearers of God. Every other arrangement that is made whenever um, two heterosexuals cohabitate without the benefit of marriage, well, when that happens, they are not entering into the perversions of those who are in, in let's say, same sex, but, but it's still a perversion. Why is that wrong? They love each other. Why is that wrong? Because it's wrong because God said that they would be one, that they would come together to be one individual and that it would have permanence to it. We're going to move on. I'm getting ahead of myself too. Um, the, the main thing that I wanted to bring out of, of verse 8 there is that God then, in response <clears throat> to Adam being created, he creates a garden. We, we talked about work last week being holy. We, we see here that he was placed in a garden for the purpose of tending it. God planted the garden. Work was God's idea for man. Work was that which God intended man to be engaged in, in the cultivation, in the husbandry that we talked about last week. God created a place, created all the things that was necessary to sustain life, for life to propagate itself under the husbandry of man. He, he did all of that and he placed it in a garden and in a place that was ready, made for cultivation. Now, if, if you were raised in a time whenever uh, chemicals were not as highly used as they are today, uh, and we... We ran a cultivator over crops to keep the weeds out till they got tall enough to shade out the weeds. And, and weeds were a thing. Can you imagine the blessing of, Terry, can you imagine the blessing of farming without weeds? <laughs> no weeds. Imagine it was all. <laughs> imagine it's all. Okay. Yeah. No weeds. He had a garden with no weeds. He had a garden that he tilled and he cultivated. He, he worked in harmony with that which was God had provided him there to produce that which was his responsibility. God had placed him over that garden and there he had the dominion. He had the responsibility but God also put something else in the garden. And I do want to read a little beyond that ninth verse, but we talked about the, the tree of life was in the midst of it, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil was there as well. 
And then in verse 16 and 17, it says, And God, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you shall freely eat, but on the tree of knowledge of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So the death sentence was placed over this tree. Now, was the tree poison? Was the tree, I mean, what was it? Was it that the, he, if he took of the fruit of that tree and ate it, that, you know, he gives it the little and then hits the ground dead? Or what, what was it? No, it was, it was much more grave than that. It would have been a very small thing in comparison had it just been physical death that was going to take place there. What God did was establish a moral order in forbidding that one tree. He, he had, this shows you something even about innocent human nature. Um, you have the whole earth you have the entire garden with all of its abundance you, you have everything that God has made at your fingertips and it's all been declared to be yours except for this one tree and it was square in the middle of the garden you, you couldn't you I, I'm satisfied there was hardly any place within the garden that this tree wasn't present. You, you could see it. It was there and it and it was it looked good. And we would see in the next chapter the the fall and the results of that, but we're not there yet. We're still looking at God's original intent in the creation of mankind. And one of the things that God intended from the beginning <clears throat> in this time of complete innocence, when Adam and then Eve following after him, when they were pristine without sin, they were given a choice. There was a moral element to that which God had created. He forbid something to them. And you might ask, as I have for many years, why? Why? What about that tree made it forbidden? Because God said. God said it was forbidden. Yeah, but, yeah, but, <laughs> all the pain and suffering of human history is the yeah, but of, of mankind. They were tempted by Satan and they said, yeah, but God said not to. And then has God really said? And all of that that follows through. But before all of that, there was this declaration of something that was forbidden to them. It was the establishment of a moral order. God, we, we talked last week about the creature, creator distinction. God is creator. He spoke everything into existence that is in existence today. He was the creator. He created everything out of nothing. He defines it. It, it is what he says it is. And when he creates it, he creates it with loving intention. He creates it in perfect order. And within his perfect order, he creates this little bitty place of forbiddenness to establish a moral order. Because if everything was a yes, if everything there was a yes, there, there would have been no power of, of choice. There would have been no moral agency. There would have been no voluntary love and voluntary loving obedience available, which was much of the purpose of man being created in the beginning was fellowship with God, to know him and enjoy him forever, to bring glory unto him. 
So when we look here, this was not a curse. God forbidding the tree in the midst of the garden was the very best thing that God could have done because there's no improvement upon God. If God did a thing, there wasn't a better option left open to him. He did it because it was good. He did it because it was best and forbidding something there, even knowing from the, the very beginning that it would be the source of the fall, it was also going to be the source of the moral order. It was going to establish that which God said and then we would see our ability to be image bearers of God in that we are redeemed from that. But again, getting way ahead of myself, what we're looking at in this is he did it and he did it with purpose and he did it for our good. He did it for Adam and Eve's good. Every time they passed by that tree, and I'm sure it was many times they passed by that tree before succumbing to the temptation of the devil, they would go by that tree. And, and I'm sure it was a curiosity to them that's forbidden and they just keep on going. But I wonder why it's forbidden. He said not to, but you know, and, and they may have even had that as a conversation because they would meet together and, and walk and talk in the cool of the day. That they could have asked why and may have for all we know. But God had good and loving intentions in doing that. So let's see the next thing that, that chapter 2 reveals about this male and female distinction and this creator and creation distinction. Verse 18 says, And the Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So first, <clears throat> God says this. God sees that it was not good. He, he created on day one, he creates the heavens and the earth, and it was good. Light from died light from the darkness, it was good. The land from the water, it was good. The plant life, it was good. The animal life, it was good. Mankind, it was good. Now he sees something that was not good. And it was not good that man would be alone. And it was because of his identifying his purpose in mankind of being in the image of God, he had to be, there, there had to be a multiplicity. It could not just be an individual, even if that individual was made up of, of three portions, he had to be more than that, to be the fullness that God desired to see creation see. A little bitty reflection of himself would have to be a husband, a wife, and children, what we would call a family. A family living together in unity. Now, now granted, that, that's not the universal experience of mankind. It's actually fairly unique that you find a, a family that, that does a great job of reflecting the glory of God. But that was God's intention from the beginning and to the highest degree that we are able to. Now, there's options for us. We see the many variations of, of what that can look like. It can look like someone, you know, a, a, a couple marrying and adopting children. I'm, I work with a lady who has three adopted children and that they have a family that is under the under the definition of that which God, they have no biological children, but they have children nonetheless. <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm not sure where this is all coming from, but <clears throat> it's hitting hard. He identifies 
man's need. He, he looks down and he sees this is not good, that man's alone. We need to minister, or we need to uh, create one that's comparable to him. So the very next thing that he does is he makes man aware of his need. So let's read the next few, next couple of verses. Verse 19 said, out of the ground, the Lord <clears throat> formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air. And he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was his name. That was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle and birds and of birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. So as he is, <clears throat> thank you, Marla. As he is <clears throat> naming the animals and these be, they're being brought to him and he is identifying, he is defining who they're, because naming is a little different then <clears throat> we don't define with names today. At least most people don't. They, they like a name and they choose that and they put that name on their child. Uh, but you know, naming things was really defining them. We see that throughout the Old Testament. And here he wanted to see what he would call them. And that's what they were called. So God brings them, and in the process of doing that, there was no one, he sees, okay, well, there's what a, a male cardinal looks like. Of course, he wasn't a cardinal until he called it a cardinal, but he, there's what a male card. there's what a female cardinal looks like. Okay, there's what a, a female elephant looks like, and a male elephant, there's what cow and bull looks like there's what and they were paired off but there was no one comparable to him god makes him aware of his need and then supplies his need he, he was, makes him aware of his lack and then supplies that lack and then whenever it comes to the end of that it says in verse 21, and the Lord caused the deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of the, his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib, which the Lord, <clears throat> then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. He brought her to the man and Adam said, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. <clears throat> the distinction between male and female. He was a unity. He was a unity in and of himself. He, he did not have that male-female distinction as yet because woman was yet to be taken from him, but when God did that, he did it for the purpose of making each necessary. He makes each necessary for the fulfillment of the other. He makes each of them integral to the making God known through living out a life that is consistent with God's intention from the beginning. <clears throat> she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Um, I was down at um, St. Patrick's Anglican Church Sunday night where Derek um, leads worship down there and Jake the, was, was preaching and he was preaching from Ephesians 5 and those of you who know what Ephesians 5 is that's husbands love your wives 
wives submit to your husbands. It, it's a it, it's a sticky thing in this uh, in this culture that we're in today. That is controversial. Who knew that was going to be the case? But uh, but what he said, and, and this is as much as I'm going to say, I'm just going to quote him. He says, it is our culture's intention in this season of time, it is our culture's intention to turn us into androgynous widgets. Now, the idea of a widget is just a, a, a cog in the machine. It's just part, interchangeable parts that men and women... Man can be a woman, a woman can be a man. All the, the, those roles are interchangeable. Those functions are interchangeable. You can even change which one you are. I mean, that, that's right now. It may not be in the future, but right now, that is the height of the distortion of God's intention from the beginning. That's as far as we have digressed to this point it's as far as what we have perverted God's original intent and when we look here we are not interchangeable widgets that, that we are not androgynous androgynous mean just meaning sexless that that we are not neither male nor female but that God created us male and female Throughout his word, we don't have time or attention to cover it all this morning. But if you read your scripture, you will see very defined roles for that which is a man's responsibility. Very defined roles for that which is a woman's responsibility. What a husband and a wife, a father and a mother, what children under their parents. All of that interaction within a well-ordered family that God created his original intent for the family was to bring glory to himself, to be image bearers of God in its fullness within that unity. That right there was God's intention from the beginning. And he took woman out of man, making them two distinct, both mankind both under the human heading, but very distinct in their emotional makeup, very distinct in their physiological makeup, very distinct in so many different ways. And that was all by design. That it was all God's good and loving design and purpose. <clears throat> and what we have is an opportunity to shine. Uh, I honestly, I would be shocked this morning if I was to get pushback from anybody in the congregation having said what I said this morning. It just should not, and I don't believe that it is controversial to say these things among this body of believers. But we're in a very dark time if somebody doesn't, if somebody doesn't give voice, if somebody doesn't shine light on the truth of this, if somebody doesn't reflect the glory of God in living this out in a loud way, I mean, we have that which God has endorsed. Yet our culture would desire to tamp down our celebration of that. That is just, it, it, I was going to say it's wrong, but it, it's, it's far more than wrong. It, it's far, it, it's not even, it's not even possible without our permission. See, silence is that which gives consent. Silence gives this stuff its head. Silence gives, we have before us, very clear. I mean, I'm not, I don't think I've shared anything this morning that was probably news to any of us, 
But we all know there are certain individuals that if we were to say any of this stuff in their presence, they would have a come apart and it would be aimed at us. I shall not fear. We sang that earlier. Um, we have a dominion mandate. We have a destiny. As mankind, under the sovereign reign of God, we have a mandate to see his will be done. It's a part of what we should be praying every day. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. What is God's will? God's will is that men and women join together in holy matrimony for the purpose of bearing the image of God to be led by his spirit into the fullness of that that they are capable of under the grace of God. That's what every single one of us are in a position to accomplish. Can any of us change the whole culture? Not a chance. No one of us will do that. But if every believer lived out loud the truths of Scripture, it would make a radical change in the culture. So your purpose is to glorify God, to make him known, to know him and make him known. And we know him and we make him known by living lives consistent with his truth and advocating for that truth for all mankind. Because this is not just true of the believer. The believer is equipped to live this out in a, in a consistent way that others will not have the same equipping to. But this is not, this is not specified believers only stuff. This is creation mandate. It's the reason that I started here going down this path is this applies to all of mankind in every nation at every time from Adam and Eve until Christ's return and then for the endless ages on. This is absolutely, eternally the will of God. And anyone who thumbs their nose at this, I mean, we have in the very next chapter the example and then everything that follows that and all of the chaos that we see in our own age all of that descends out of one, yeah, but. Out of one man whose wife listened to a serpent and then the blame game starts. Well, it was that woman that you gave me and the woman said, well, it was that snake that was in the garden. And, and, but who does Adam really blame it on? Adam blames it on God. It was that woman that you gave me. And you thought I needed a helpmate, but look at what she did. It was the blame game. Blame has to be completely taken out of this. Are, are women the problem today? Are men the problem today? Are children the problem today? Yes. Yes. That's all the problem. Getting aligned with God's original intent brings about a restoration of all of that. It is the, it is the reversing of the curse as far as the curse is found. You know, we we want to see God's blessing. We want to see God's flourishing in the world today. We want to see him seen as good and beautiful and powerful. We want to see all of that because we know it to be true. To see that, we have to put that on display. And as we put that on display through actually living lives that are consistent with his revealed will. 
and proclaiming that this is the gospel. The one no gospel is Jesus died for my sin according to the scripture was raised on the third day. This is gospel. This is good news. God created them, male and female. It doesn't matter how you feel. You, you, may, you may wake up, trim your beard, and feel pretty that morning. You're not a girl. It, it doesn't matter how you feel. Now, I, I, don't, I, I can sympathize with, with very real issues that very real people are, are struggling with, especially within the culture right now. But these things are not difficult to resolve, even if they're difficult to live consistently with. Just seeing uh, a young woman who had transitioned to live as a male, who seen the error of her way, and returned to her biological sex, realized God made them male and female, and she living as a female, fully embracing, she still has lingering issues from the attempted transition that was attempted to make, but she is rejoicing in the grace of God and living consistent with God's intention for her life, these things are not, that they don't have permanence. The, the disorders do not have permanence, regardless of what the disorder is. God's order is the only permanent thing that there is. God established this two chapters in, or one chapter in. Verse 27, chapter 1. He made them male and female. This rash that we see of confusion over that, that, that rash of confusion that is being embraced by the popular culture today is being embraced for one reason and one reason only. It is because they would not retain the knowledge of God in their mind. God gives them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are unseemly. It's Romans 1. And Romans 1 speaks of Genesis 1 and 2. God created that order. And anyone who thumbs their nose at God's order will live a disordered life and will have the consequences of it. And whenever that is done on a mass scale, then that nation or that locality, wherever that's being expressed, that will have with it the, the same response from God. The, the same response from God. It begins with a withholding of blessing that would have been present had there been a, a consistency with God's order. There is a blessing. There is a flourishing in the obedience to God's order. And the very first level of it is to get the just recompense of reward for that which you are sowing. It's the sowing and reaping thing that we talked about in, in Sunday school this morning. Then from there, you get to a point to where it's the given overness. If you wonder how it is that, that people miss this, because it's so simple, it's so foundational, it, it's so obvious. How is it that it, it's deception, it's strong delusion? And it is the choice of generations that have made this possible that there would be confusion on something this foundational, this basic. That confusion is not natural. Nature would lead us here. It is not natural. It is supernatural. It, it is a, a people taking the opinion, since there is no God, I see a vacancy. 
I'll be as God. I will define my own life. I will take the authority to call myself what I want to call myself. Notice that Adam was given charge over every animal, every bird, every creeping thing, to name it and to define its purpose, to, to do all of that. Eve, Eve he calls woman. She was taken out of man. Adam doesn't define Adam. God defined Adam. And by extension defined Eve because she was taken from Adam. God alone, God didn't need mankind's help in defining his purposes for mankind. He chose them. He chose those purposes. He declared those purposes and they are as settled as as God's own word. He has settled it once and for all. He separated them out and then he unites them together. And we'll wrap this up quickly with his last couple of verses, 24 and 25. It said, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined into his wife and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Shame didn't come in until after the fall. They were both naked and they were unashamed. And the, the most obvious reason for the lack of shame over their nakedness was that there was no guilt yet, but more fundamental was in their, in their innocence. I've said this several times, but... Um, I don't think it was fallen nature that caused uh, Adam to recognize, recognize Eve's nakedness. I, I think he noticed. I mean, he, he was a man. I think he noticed her nakedness. I think she probably returned the favor and noticed his, but they didn't notice their own. They weren't self-centered. They were other-centered until they took that which wasn't theirs and then they became self-centered then they became aware of their nakedness then they desired to hide from god to hide from one another they were totally transparent up to that time but god separated them for the purpose of uniting them consciously the two would be one and then it would go on from there, they were they lived transparent lives before one another, and they were unashamed. That was the created state. That was the state that, that God had from the beginning. And that's the one that he would have every single one of us to be moving towards. Perfect timing. I guess they figured it's noon, it must be time.